Hello, everyone. My name is Mariette DiCristina, and I'm the Dean of the College of Communication here at Boston University. I'm also an alum and the parent of a recent BU grad. Welcome to today's panel discussion, Women in Sports Communication, which is part of our ongoing virtual event series called ComTalks. This session is being recorded and will be available later on Com's website and on its YouTube channel. Sports communication remains a male-dominated field or does it? Increasingly, however, women, including many of us here at COM, are forging new paths and finding success in sports-related journalism, television, business, advertising, and public relations. What does the future hold for women just now entering the field, and what lessons might they learn? We're going to explore these and many more questions with a terrific panel of women excelling in sports communications, each taking different paths, and each, I'm proud to say, a graduate of Boston University's College of Communication. There'll be plenty of time for you to ask your questions later. And when you do, please put them in the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen rather than in the chat. Now let me introduce our speakers. Please join me in saying hello to Sonia Chen, who is a reporter producer for Major League Baseball. Thanks for joining us, Sonia. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you here. Caroline Klein serves as the Chief Communication Officer for the NBA's Utah Jazz. Hi there, Caroline. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. Jenny Taft is a reporter and host for Fox Sports, and you may have seen her covering the Fight World Cup, among other assignments. Hey there, Jenny. Hello. Nice to chat with all of you guys today. Great to have you. And let's say hello to Danae Wilkins, who's manager of brand communications for NBA's Chicago Bulls. Nice to see you, Danae. Hi, happy to be here. Serving as moderator for today's discussion is the wonderful Andrea Kramer, analyst for Amazon Thursday Night Football and correspondent for HBO Real Sports. She's also a lecturer for Calm in our class, The Art of the Interview. I'm now gonna pass the mic to Andrea. Welcome to all of you and thanks a million, Andrea. Nice to see you here. Thanks, Dean. It's great to see you as well and to have this incredibly esteemed group of female panelists. Uh, I am very honored to be with all of you. I think that uh, each of you has taken a varied path since calm. So I just want to start off. I, I, I don't need the recitation of your resume. People can go online and they can find that. I want to understand as we let's start with the most experienced. Notice that I don't say the oldest because we don't we don't talk about age as women, especially me. Believe me, we talk about experience. The most experienced would be Caroline, who graduated uh, com in two thousand seven with a degree. Um, I am believe in magazine journalism. Is that correct? That's correct. So when I think about your path, I think of the words career pivot. So how did you go? <laughs> From, <clears throat> excuse me, what was the circuitous route that you took from COM to Chief Communications Officer for the Utah Jazz? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And it's actually funny. I always like to start by saying that when I was seven and my family had our first computer, I actually started my own newspaper at home, which was a complete gossip rag. But I grew up always wanting to be a journalism major. But then I actually decided to focus on the PR path right after graduating from BU. And the reason I did that was because it allowed me to tell a variety of stories through media instead of just sharing my own voice. Um, I found my first job on Craigslist, which definitely shows my age, and spent seven years at PR agencies and travel and hospitality. Travel and hospitality had always been such a passion for me, and I was incredibly grateful and lucky to be able to work in an industry that allowed me to be a passionate storyteller and work in travel. Um, it was a dream come true. I, after working at agencies, I worked at a company called Preferred Travel Group. Um, I started as a PR manager. I worked my way up to chief communications officer. I did PR, social media, corporate communications, launched an in-house agency there, um, took the company from B2B to B2C. It was an incredible opportunity. I got to see the world. I got to travel the world. It was an absolute dream job. But um, I'm a little crazy, and I was always craving something more. I had this great thing in front of me. Um, I loved the team I worked with. But I wanted to be part of a community. The company that I work for was very global. Um, so I started to just think about other opportunities. And it was actually one year ago this week um, that I got a call from a recruiter. And soon thereafter, I officially stepped into this role as the first ever chief communications officer for the Utah Jazz. 
I'd also have taken this job spending a total of eight hours in Salt Lake City, um, and luckily it's worked out beautifully. So I like to say I threw myself into this tornado, which included hosting an all-star game, having never actually been to one, um, and definitely got the challenge I was looking for. But when I look at my career path, I always look at myself as a professional communicator, first and foremost, and my career journey has been taking whatever it throws at me, again, going from PR manager to internal comms to corporate comms to crisis. Um, and so the pivot into sports has been an interesting one for a variety of reasons, but not as it relates to uh, being a communicator. Gotcha. Yes, you have, uh, it's 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 kind of it, it really is to me. I, I saw Danae respond when you said All Star Game, but that's sort of <laughs> experience, and uh, yeah, that that's really amazing in itself. Jenny, you are up next, having graduated in in 2010. Uh, I am curious if if on air was always your aspiration, but uh, what was the roadmap that you took from Com to Fox Sports, especially because when you think about a road. There's bumps and there's detours and and how would how would you characterize your your journey there? Well, uh, it's a great question and I love hearing all these stories. I loved yours, Caroline. That was really interesting. Um, and I have many colleagues that know you and have said how great you're doing. So congratulations on the role first. Um, so for me, it was all over the place. I did always want to be on on air. Andrea, I always had a dream of working in sports. I guess when I was little, I would pretend to interview my teammates on the field. And I also really liked theater as a young kid. So in a lot of ways, broadcast journalism felt similar where I was kind of performing, but playing myself and I loved sports. So it was a great combination. I grew up in an athletic family. My dad was a hockey player. I ended up marrying a hockey player. My brother played. My mom was a speed skater. So like sports were always what we did. Uh, I can't really imagine not having that in my life. And I went to BU so excited about the journalism school, was fortunate enough to play lacrosse and loved that experience as well at BU and naively moved to New York City after graduating. It was not easy to get an on-air job there. I think we all knew that. I knew that. And I still knew and then realized I was going to have to go back to Minnesota and just try the smaller market route. And I got lucky because Fox Sports North had reached out to me. I'd interned with them in college and they were hiring in the marketing department, but they knew I wanted to be on air because I had interned there and made some great friends and connections along the way. And I took a marketing job kind of knowing that hopefully if I worked hard, I could get my foot in the door. And it was a lot of practicing behind the scenes when the actual games were done and I'd convince some of the camera operators to let me do some practice stand-ups or read the prompter just to, to get some reps. So I kind of, my philosophy is just, it's not always going to be the perfect job right away, but I do believe that those connections you make, I mean, I was an intern and they remembered me and reached out. So all that matters and just kind of being a good person and teammate, like, are you good to work with? Because so much of what we do I think we all probably gravitate towards sports because we like that team aspect and it's yes the team we're watching but the broadcast team is a team the PR team is a team I mean we're all in this team atmosphere and that's about who you're working with so uh it's been a, a quite the journey and I'm really lucky to be in this world yeah and you you so many things that really resonate you know you don't always get your first choice folks coming out of school sometimes you have to 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 go in different directions um for for you uh, Danae, you graduated in, in 2018. Um, what were sort of the pivotal points for you as you went from Com to, to the Chicago Bulls as the brand manager? Yes, yeah, so um, I initially wanted to be a journalism major and I took like two class, like two sessions of one class. And I was like, this is not for me. Um, and so my like best friends were like, taking, I think it was like Com 201, or maybe, I don't know. And that's how I, I got into PR. Um, and I knew after graduation that I wanted to be in Chicago for sure. Um, and my parents were kind of like, well, you know, we're not going to help you move there to be a waitress because you can be a waitress in New Jersey. Um, so I had to get a job. And um, I think at the beginning of my career, I kind of felt like 
being in an agency was like the only way to be successful. Um, so I started at Edelman and then um, I was, sorry about that team's message. I was um, unemployed for a, a hot minute. So I ended up taking a marketing job, hated it, was like, I'm not made for this, um, went back to another agency and then finally made the transition in-house. Uh, it just was a better fit for me. And um, I also wanted to work with a big brand. Um, I was working with like medical associations at my last agency and, and that's cool and healthcare is great, but I wasn't making as much of an impact with my storytelling as I felt like I could have with a bigger brand, um, which is how I ended up at the Bulls. It was not I, unlike Jenny, I'm not a sports person at all, much to my parents' dismay. It was not, not it for me. Um, it just was the right opportunity at the right time. And, and so far, so good. But I'm just curious, did you like sports as a kid? I was kind of indifferent. Like oh. I, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm pretty tall. I'm 5'10". So I think everyone thought I was going to play basketball but I just was really bad at sports and I also was like I don't want to run so that that was not really my jam um but now that I'm in the sports world it's a lot of fun and I definitely see why so many people are passionate about it gotcha gotcha um all right our, our last panelist I want to call her the wonderkind because I can't believe I'm about to say this but a year ago she hadn't even graduated yet, which is which is just amazing. Uh, Sonia, what was the experience, the preparation that you got at Com that enabled you to to really virtually step right into an on air job as well as being a writer for the AP? And congratulations sure. on that in itself. I just I, I can't believe that you're not even a year away from graduation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. It's um, you know, hard for me to believe too, you know, that this is kind of where I am already. And um, just one clarification, I'm I'm not on air. Um, I'm a reporter producer for MLB.com, so okay. that kind of means that I um, you know, we have um beat writers for all thirty clubs, and I I fill in for the ones that don't um that don't come to the Bay Area. Um, so I I work in um print, but. Yeah, I mean, my my journey to MLB.com, it really started at Com. Um, when I was a, a junior, I took my first um, sports journalism class and my professor, um, Sherrod Blakely, he kind of got me in touch, helped me get my foot in the door with um, the people at MLB.com when there was an opening. Um, and it was... I didn't end up getting, you know, the position I applied for, um, which I kind of didn't expect to because it seemed like they were looking for someone with more experience. Um, but then that turned into an internship that summer, which was before my senior year. I guess I made it enough of a good impression to get hired right after graduation um, in kind of the seasonal version of the role that I'm in now. And then that turned into um, my current full-time role over the off season. Sorry, I love car outside. Um, and for writing for the AP, that was kind of the connection that I made on the job at, um, you know, at the ballparks in the Bay Area. So it, it's really like the power of connections, um, like, um, like I believe Jenny said, and, um, you know, people, there's a lot of people out there that can help you. And I think being open to that help is really important. Um, that's something that I tried to learn at Calm and along the way. And so far it's been, it's been really good. Yeah, there's no doubt that I, I call them the soft skills, but you know, they may be the most vital and making relationships and, and remembering that, uh, and, and Jenny alluded to it, it, it is a people business. And and you will find, as probably Caroline has, that the longer you get in this business, people want to work with the people they want to work with. And there might even be a bit of a sacrifice because people don't want to work with jerks. It's just that it's just that simple. So I think that uh, I, I think that that's something that is always very important to remember. So look, uh, we are in a male-dominated business. I I always love to say 
Jenny talked about a little bit regarding teamwork. Women collaborate, they communicate, they cooperate, they don't just compete. Uh, that's certainly been my experience in 40 years, excuse me, uh, sorry, had to clear my throat uh, for a second, of, of being in, in this business. But what I want to throw out to all of you is what are the unique issues? I don't even know if I want to call them challenges that you have found in the male dominated field. And I, I will start off with Caroline because I, you, there's some misconceptions out there about this issue for you, right? Yes. You mean in terms of it's an advantage or disadvantage? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think I, I, so I love this question because I always turn it on its head and it's something that my uh, previous CEO had helped me realize in voice. So a fun fact is before I joined the jazz, I had only ever been managed by or reported to women, which is incredible if you think about it. I mean, hospitality was also a very male dominated industry. I think because I had really strong female role models, went through a single sex education system in high school, and then of course lived on an all female floor on Warren Towers uh, my freshman year, I never saw or used gender as an advantage or disadvantage. I really was taught to use my voice as, and my voice, my opinion as loudly as I wanted to after being educated, of course. And I always just demonstrated my value and stood up for my worth because it was how I showed respect for myself. So it may be easier said than done, but I think we only harm ourselves if we approach situations seeing gender as an obstacle. Um, and similar to advice I give my friends, I always say, don't see ghosts, only see what's in front of you. So if you see gender as a disadvantage, it's always going to be in the back of your mind. So embrace it and just be yourself and use the education and the skills that you have to just demonstrate why you're in a room instead of always trying to defend it. Yeah, I, I really agree with Caroline there that, um, you know, I, I think using kind of your gender as an advantage or trying as hard as you can to not, you know, prevent you from just going for things. I think that's been key um, because from my experience, which is, you know, pretty brief professionally, you know, as long as you know what you're talking about, you know what you're doing, you put the work in, you know, you're going to get respect from, you know, in my role, players, managers, your fellow members of the media. Um, I think a lot of people perceive like some more issues with that, but, you know, once you're in, out in the field, you're being seen as a person and you're being seen more for, um, you know, what you're putting out there than for who you are. Again, just my experience. I think too, um, so with me being on the brand side and doing like business operations, there's a lot of women in the front office. Um, I think once it goes to like basketball comms and like basketball operations, that's when it really is um, male dominated. And so I think that I would maybe have a different experience if I was on that side of things. But um, like my, the, the EVP of my department, she's a woman, my manager is a woman. I work with so many women, which is good to see. Um, and I've never felt like that was holding me back in any way. I think if anything, like me not knowing the rules of basketball was more so an issue than me being a, a woman. All right, Jenny, let's talk about the on-air challenges because I've been the first, you know, I, I opened ESPN's bureau in Chicago. I was the first, you know, female ever to work at NFL Films. I've been a lot of firsts, uh, which hopefully is made a little bit easier for you, but uh, Don't say that. what's your experience? Well, it has in a lot of ways. And I think, Andrea, your story is so important to highlight just because it hasn't been that long. I know you aged yourself when you said 40 years, what you were saying there. But the truth is, I always had women I looked up to. And I always did have strong female role models in the sports world. I mentioned Fox Sports North being that place that I interned. And Marnie Gellner is still on there today. And she actually still does a lot with the Timberwolves. So some of you in the basketball space may know her. Um, she's wonderful. And she was a role model. And she just was always the kind of person who would say, bring me a coffee and you can shadow me and ask me any questions you want. I would always bring her a white chocolate mocha before every game day. And she just let me shadow her. And she didn't see me as a threat. She saw me as someone she just wanted to spread the love and experience. So 
in that way, I always had women I could look up to. And then the other side in growing up as an athlete, it did give me a different kind of confidence. And I don't want to say you have to be an athlete to work in sports, but there's the misconception. Oh, well, she's a female. She didn't play football. How can she talk about the game? And I know Andrea and I have heard that like every which way, but I can hold my own in any athletic competition. And I would put myself up against a lot of these guys. And it just has given me a sense to feel that I always did deserve a seat at that table. Um, There is always going to be that extra criticism, you know, you don't make mistakes, but that's in any of our worlds, right? You can't, you have to be at the top of your game because we live in a world where for, for me, I'm only as good as my last job in a lot of ways. And you are always kind of on display, but you have to hold yourself to that high standard. But I would be doing that if I was in front of the camera or behind and just being confident in who I am as a female, but also a female athlete who never felt intimidated, probably because my dad, had me skating with the boys and I could, I could do it from an early age. And why am I any different? I never had that feeling that I was, and that's always kind of given me a a big confidence in this world. But Andrea, thank you. Cause it was was different back then. (laughs) It's my heart to hear you guys all say this because I, I say this to people when I when a lot of times when I speak and they look at me quizzically until they actually intellectualize what I'm saying, which is when I was, when I was certainly growing up and when I was in college, I didn't exist. There wasn't a me to look to and say, oh, I'd like to do what she does. So the idea, uh, and and by the way, hence all of my mentors have always been men. And and thank goodness they've been men who really taught me. They weren't interested in anything else, which, you know, thank goodness I didn't have to navigate. But uh, so it I'm I'm really, I'm really happy and encouraged to hear all of this from from you guys, from your personal experiences. That being said, and Maybe we can put this in the chat, Jen. Um, McKinsey did a Women in the Workplace 22 report. Uh, Women in the Workplace in 2022. And uh, the report found, I'm just going to, you know, we're, we're all in the numbers business in sports, right? So I don't want to get too wrapped up in, in all of these, but just a couple of things. And Danae and, and Caroline, please listen to these really intently. In the C-suite, only one in four is a woman. In the sports industry, women hold between 10 and 20% of leadership roles. And if that if that number seems low, consider that it's high compared to 10 years ago when that number was cut by two-thirds. And in terms of globally, less than 20% of students in sports postgraduate programs are women. So what what do we need to do, folks, to make the sports business jobs more attractive for women to want to get into? I think um, just like taking opportunities that I have to share my experience, I think that it's easy um, to feel like it's an obstacle when you don't have someone to look to. Um, but like taking opportunities like this to share my story. And when people like women reach out on LinkedIn and, you know, talking to some of the interns at the Bulls, like just being very upfront that like, this is something that you can do because I'm here doing it. And like, even though I'm not in the nitty gritty of like the sports reporters and I'm not traveling with the team, like my manager, who's the director of basketball comms, like she's a woman. So like there are definitely like examples to point to and just taking those, that time to share. Yeah, Danae, I couldn't agree with you more because um, Andrew, I mean, those, those statistics, let's hope they keep going in the right direction. But I've read a lot that the lack of females in sports um, is one of the key barriers because we need role models as Danae was saying. And so it's not women's inability to perform the function. It's just, there's not that much inclusivity. Like we need to be celebrating more of that because I think sometimes people see, well, I don't have another female who could relate or I haven't seen this or it's an old boys club. And look, in a way sports really is still an old boys club, 
but it's about surrounding yourself with the right people and realizing like it's great to blaze a trail sometimes, right? As I was saying before, it's like, who cares if there's not a woman in that position before? Who cares? You might be the only one. I actually think it's really exciting. Like you feel like such a badass when you're in a room with a bunch of guys and you're like, you've all worked in sports your entire life. I have not, but I've earned my seat here. Um, And I think too, it's just, it's like always championing and it's that reverse mentorship as Jenny was speaking to, right? So I'm in this position and how can you reach out to someone else how can you show that to someone else and just continue to tell your story that career pivots are scary, but they're also the best growth opportunity. And we all owe it to ourselves to continue to grow and show that it is possible and help break that perception potentially that some barriers are too hard to be broken or too difficult. Yeah. Um, and, and, and by the way, um, sometimes we learn what we want to do by learning what we don't want to do. And I think that each of us has certainly experienced that. But uh, I want to throw one other set of numbers at at everyone. And uh, Sonia actually brought this to my attention. Jan, uh, Allison, if we could put it up, it's it's a research study conducted by Pew, the Pew Institute. This one, this one, this one hurt me. Jenny and and Sonia are going to relate to this. Um, amongst U.S. journalists, reporting journalists, so it could be anyone print, TV, producers, anybody in the journalism field, okay? 51% are men, 46% are women. That that sounds really good to me. But in sports, get ready for it. 83% men, 15% women. That number blew me away. And if you look at a racial breakdown, 82% are white, 5% are black, 6% Hispanic, and you go, girl, Sonia, 1% Asian. So what if, if, if as Caroline says, we all really said it, you have to see it to be it. What do we think is keeping women, female journalists from entering into this fray? And what do we do, all of us, whether we're on the journalism side or the PR, or the bar, what do we do to try to encourage? Because, you know, diversity is not just supposed to be for numbers. Diversity is supposed to be for perspectives and thought and experience, and we have to have it, and we really need to have it in sports. So what do we think, women? How do we solve this issue? I, you know, just those numbers, like you said, that they are kind of staggering, and it's one of those things where anecdotally, you know, I... I don't want to say like I wasn't surprised. I guess I was surprised by how bad it actually was. But, you know, there are some times when I definitely have been the only like woman in the room. And it's kind of one of the first times in my life, really, where that's been in the case. And, you know, it it is a little shocking. Um, But like, um, you know, like we've been saying, I think the visibility talking about our experiences is key. But then also, you know, when we have the power to, you know, doing what we can to help get um, underrepresented journalists or um, uh, in um, communications, you know, getting them into these positions, um, giving people a hand up when possible. Um, Because that's a thing, you know, that a lot of men in the business have been able to do throughout their whole careers. They've been able to you know, open, open doors. And I think when we have the chance to do that, you know, we need to try to make the path a little easier. Um, Because when there's these, you know, perceived barriers to entry, you know, that, that we're not getting anywhere if we're not doing something like concrete to help get more women and um, people of color into the industry. I've thought a lot about this on a bigger level in terms of doing these kind of chats are always really important and something I tried to do. And also those numbers are a little surprising to me. I mean, I'm, I'm truly shocked that we haven't progressed more because I do feel like I see more women um, in our world um, just in general, all races. And I just, I feel like it's growing, but it's not there yet. I always try to, when I'm at games, uh, allow anyone to shadow me. I reach out to the communication school often um, when I'm on site. And now I have so many games where I'm back at the same places. So at Michigan last year, I had four women on the field with me and I was like, okay, four might be too many. I feel like I'm now not hiding on the sidelines, but 
just giving like those small opportunities and staying in touch with those women. And I'm proud to say that like the lady Emma who shadowed me at Iowa now works at Fox sports. And like, I've just tried to help in, and again, that's one individual or two individuals that I've helped, but it's like seeing that exposure and maybe all of us, and maybe in every space, we could all just try to be able to open those doors in ways that maybe weren't open before, like Sonia mentioned. And I just want to spread that because working in sports is, I mean, I, sometimes I don't even feel like it's a job, right? I think we all are so fortunate to do something that we really love and it doesn't feel like work. A lot of the times it's hard, but it doesn't feel like work. And, uh, I'm just going to try to keep hoping I can reach out and grow and be accessible to more women in the future. That's always the goal. And I think Calm at BU does a good job with those little things. I'm, I'm curious from the management standpoint or, or you know, from Caroline and Danae's standpoint, I don't know how many women you come across in your market, uh, how many women are uh, on, on the beat or anything like that. What, what, what is your experience and your thoughts about the idea of, of growing? And again, we don't need women because they're women. We need the right people. And oh, by the way, if they're women and if they're minorities, double minorities, great. What 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 are your what are your thoughts? What are, what are your personal experiences? Well, I think one of the things that's so interesting about the Jazz's um, basketball communications team, to what Danae said, was we actually have more women on our basketball communications team than men, and so that's very rare in the NBA. Um, I have four females on that team, but in our market, only one of our beat writers of seven, and we're also very rare in how many beat writers we have for the size market we do, is a female. Um, and she has been in multiple markets. She's amazing. And she's so highly respected. So I don't know if it's about, to your point, Andrea, like if it's about how do we get more females into it, or is it just sometimes like the right place for them to want to be. I don't, I think it's like, I love when women grow up and wanting to be journalists. And again, as I was saying, it's like, instead of focusing on a team or a city following where the opportunity is. So I think we just have to foster more of that, like encouraging women to know, like you could go into sports comms or for jerk for professors or mentors to say, Hey, this is actually an opportunity for you. Because again, I didn't even think about it until I worked for the jazz. And so I think it's just more education and that continuing conversation of, of what Jenny was saying. And I think also too, um, like us being privileged enough to work for these um, entities in the industry, like creating change from the inside out, like pushing for community programs that we could do that would, you know, encourage women to try to get into the sports industry, like supporting like girls playing sports you know like using the platform that I have especially like from the Bulls standpoint like everybody knows who the Bulls are and in Chicago it's such a big thing that it's like being able to use these platforms and tell these stories about women like is a way that we can use our actual work that we're doing to like uplift people even if it's not directly like speaking to a panel. Can I just take, can I just, just um, uh, beg to differ with one thing that you just said though, Danae, you said okay. you were privileged to work for the Bulls and that's a great attitude to have, but make no mistake, you earned where you are. And I think that that's something that all, and this goes back to the whole lean in Cheryl Sandberg. You probably, you know, none of you probably even know about that because you're all too young, but the, uh, this, listen, none of us are here because we're just lucky. We're all here because we've worked our butts off and we all deserve to be here. So I don't know. I, I just had to say that. All right. Now, listen, I always love to play a little show and tell. And and um, Caroline used one of my favorite words. In fact, I was going to tweet it out, but I never know if you're allowed to use the word ass on tweeting or not. Uh, we're all badasses, right? So I saw this and, and, and my communications brand people are going to love this, right? Now, bear with me while I share my screen. Andrea's a big girl, she can do this and stand by. All right, here's our girl, Angel Reese. On July 1st, 2021, the Supreme Court launched college sports into a new era. We're in a new era where women are culture drivers, builders, and power players. Our actions now will empower the next generation. We control this revolution and are reclaiming our place in the $16 billion industry we help build. 
progress is contagious, our naysayers have no choice but to accept this new path. The days of underexposure, underinvestment, and underrepresentation are over. We push boundaries and the world's taking notice. This is only the beginning. Lean in or lose. I love that. Uh, you know, no one typifies being a badass right now more than more than Angel Reese for me. But um, th this really caught my mind. And you guys are not going to believe where I'm going with this. Because you think I'm going to go like, oh, great. Let's talk about women's sports. Guess what? Here's what's really rankling me. Don't get me don't get me going on things because it's not a safe place to be. All right. Women's sports are so hot. We just saw what went on with the national championship game right with and and all the amazing talent that's out there and can you believe a league that that doesn't even have enough spots for all the talent and that that's going on out there why women why help me understand what's going on in the wnba okay wnba just changed their media policy to close the locker rooms okay help me understand how this is going to grow the game benefit the female athletes help me help me help you help me understand please what 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 do, what do we make of this i don't think it will help um <laughs> i think that for me something that is so frustrating is like seeing an nba game and how much money goes into that and how big these like productions are like I mean, we have like entertainment, there's like advertisers, like there's so much going on and these men are getting paid so much money to do the exact same thing that the women are doing in the WNBA. And it's so frustrating. Like I m remember my friend and I went to a Chicago Sky game and that's our WNBA team last summer. And it was like, I mean, they're playing in the same arena that DePaul University is playing in. Like, I mean, it's just so crazy. The halftime performance were like five seconds and it just, sorry, don't get me started on this. Like I, it is so crazy to me, but Something that I will say that I think the Bulls do a good job of is we have a couple of guys on our team who are just as passionate about women in sports and like taking those opportunities to like create social content where the men are talking about how important it is. You know, one of our star players has four daughters and he's talked on our channels about how important it is to support women in sports. So even though it is frustrating. I feel like there are, at least in my experience, some men in the NBA that notice the difference and are like passionate about that difference and take their platform to try to speak on it because unfortunately they'll break through the noise quicker and easier than we will. Carolyn, as, as a decision, wait, oh, I'm sorry, Jenny, you go, you go ahead. No, please, please start. No, please. My quick side note is just thinking about um, growth and just women's sports as a whole, but I am going to be at a, in Australia, New Zealand for the U S women's national team for soccer. Right. And I think what's so cool about, I've now covered them since 2015 and seeing the way that their success over the last couple world cups, and obviously they're going for a three peat this year, but that in my eyes has shown us that the women are just as good, if not better than the men. And I can't say that because I work for both teams, but you know what I'm saying? Like they're incredible. And it, watching their success proves that female athletes in all spaces have that potential. And I get excited because I think that as a country, when we start to rally behind the U.S. women, and at least what I've seen at a World Cup, that hopefully will continue to spread for all other sports. That's just my hope and excitement. And I people ask me what my favorite sport to cover is, and it's covering the women. I mean, I am so inspired being around them. I mean, they are just amazing. So just side note, that's coming up this summer. Uh, so yeah, that's just my small take on just hopefully their success. And they don't have to win it again. I hope they do. But that exposure will hopefully just continue to spread for all women. That's my thoughts. Caroline, as someone who oversees departments that involve, how can the WNBA be doing this and, and think that this is going to be good for their game? Yeah, I, it, it, I actually, it's just baffling to me because um, I think it's a it's a step back for media professionals because you can't do your job. So it's a step back for journalism. It's a step back for personal branding for the players, the league getting more exposure. Like 
it goes on and on because I know that like all of us here and everyone who's listening knows that you're always going to get the best story from that one-on-one -on -one engagement. Like no personal stories come from post-game or pre-game media availability. Um, and the locker room really is where that happens. So like, you're not going to get the, like that small little nugget when people are on the press conference stage. So I just, I don't see how it's going to help build more interest. Uh, I'm a little, I'm very confused as to it. I think when you look at what Jenny was saying with women's soccer, like the personal brands that they've been able to create is because of that great media exposure and because people are interested. And so I think for the WNBA athletes, like let's do more to celebrate them and give them opportunities. Um, because again, it's not just, this is not just about creating a barrier between the players and the media. It's going to create more work for the PR people. We're going to see like more and more formulaic stories that people could search on Google. So I, I'm really hoping that they realize the mistake here, just because I, I think with all of the interest that we saw with the NCAA tournament, it just, again, I don't know what the word to say, like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, I, I just don't see it. Even though, Sonia, even though you are in the baseball space, it's young journalists like you who are just getting into the business and you need to cultivate contacts and you're learning about stories. It's people like you who are going to be hurt the most. You, you brought this attention. You brought this. I know this is important to you. What, what do you make of this? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with what Caroline's saying, you know, you kind of need that locker room access to create original content, get nuggets, just get anything interesting about the athletes, honestly, like, you know, you're, you're not going to have those same conversations in a mixed zone. And I, I don't think anyone's going to get the PR person to grab a player to have like a little chat, you know, outside the locker room. So I think it, you know, it really hurts the industry and, and people who haven't been able to, you know, build those relationships yet. Um, and just thinking about to, you well, know, the history of women having you know, locker room access at all. You know, it's something that um, women have had to fight for. And, you know, now that's being taken away from by the WNBA, you know, I know that's not just something for women journalists, but it feels like such a big step back. Um, at the same time, I, I want to be, you know, I want to have some empathy for the athletes because I think, you know, we probably need to ask some questions about why they, you know, want their locker rooms to be closed, you know, I don't think this would be happening without that. And women definitely, you know, will fall under more scrutiny for things like, you know, just looking at the NCAA tournament and how Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, you know, the difference in how they're portrayed for, um, you know, how they're reacting. Um, you got to think that stuff like that factors in. So I, I want to take a nuanced position on it, but I do ultimately think it's got to be bad for the, the sport. I will tell you all, and, and not that this is going to make any kind of difference, but uh, early next week, the Associated Press Sports Editors, APSC, as well as Awesome, the Association of Women in Sports Media. And if you are, if you are all not involved in Awesome, uh, it, it's, it's a terrific organization that I would definitely espouse looking into. They are meeting with the WNBA early next week to, to address this issue. And Awesome has certainly had uh, success in, in trying to navigate some of these, uh, these, these uh, difficult topics. All right, before we open up for questions, um, I want to turn to one thing, which is the work-life balance. And why do I always think that that's something that's like code word for family, having a family, and, and that's something that men don't have to deal with? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh, all, all, all I know is I remember being in Beijing in 2008 covering swimming for the Olympics and, and you know, like two hours before I'm getting ready to go watch Michael Phelps win his 18,000th gold medal, one of my friends forgot where I am and called me to say, hey, can we can we set up a play date for tomorrow? So, yeah, you know, we've all, uh, yeah, just wait, Jenny, you'll be there. Jenny is a new mom, everybody, baby Gigi, <laughs> us with her presence last year. Um, what's the key to trying to have a life while you're also trying to build a career? Well, I, Andrea, I want you to tell me because you've <laughs> figured it out. I'm, I'm the one who needs to be asking you. Um, no, I think, 
that it's been so fascinating and such so rewarding. Gigi just turned one. And funny enough, my husband and I, we kept going back and forth on when to start a family and it never felt right with my work and scheduling and busy. And then when we just stopped overthinking it and we're like, we're just going to figure it out. That's when it happened. And when you, when we stopped putting that pressure on a timing, because we're all, we're all busy, like with or without a kid. I, I mean, I, I laughed cause I don't really know what I was doing before a kid, but I was still busy. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm figuring out along the way, I did not bring Gigi to Qatar last world cup, which was really, really hard. And I'm probably not going to bring her to Australia. And I'm really struggling over that, but it just, as many of you know, when we're in our work and it's all consuming and a world cup is not a lot of sleep. And so in my head, if she's there, she's not even going to see me. And it's also really far away. So I think that's a, a struggle that we are all going to deal with as working moms. And, um, my husband is going to be helpful and present with her, but yeah, I miss her. And it's hard to kind of be able to do both, but what's so cool is, and I always remember or try to remind myself that I hope, and I know that Gigi will be proud one day when she's able to say, well, how cool that my mom was involved in those events. And she was covering these incredible women. So I want to be someone she looks up to one day. And that's what kind of motivates me along the way. But Andrea, we'll talk offline. Call me, definitely call me. <laughs> I, call me, call me. That's all Thanks. I can do. <laughs> Everybody remember that this idea of being there for each other, for women, that that's maybe the overriding thing here. But um, but yes, please call me. Please call me. Um, anybody, any anybody else want to sort of chime in with the with the challenges of of having a life? Yeah, Andrea, I mean, I had shared this with you before the panel, but I think some of the advice that I give women getting into communications or wanting to have a path is you kind of have to choose. Like you can't necessarily, like if you want to grind and you want to get to an executive position in your early thirties, like you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of your personal life. It's not a great reality, but it's true. Like when I look back at my twenties and early thirties, do I wish I had had more of a social life? Do I wish I'd made more friends? sometimes, but at the same time, like I just realized that I'm a workhorse. I love to hustle. I like to work, um, working until midnight sometimes like was fun because I realized how productive I was being and how much I was growing as a human. And so I've had conversations with a lot of women I mentor to say, don't try to be like, you know, if you want to have a great social life, lean into that. You can still do a great job at work, but don't wonder why you're not getting somewhere if every day you're only working nine to five and you're not taking advantage of extra opportunities. And sometimes it is those last minute things where you might have to cancel plans with someone because your boss just said, hey, can you go handle this for me? Like, yes, always take that opportunity because I think, again, we all have to hustle and we all have to do it. Um, I worked from 5 a.m. till midnight last night. Like, ideal? No, but at the same time, I'm trying to work on something so that like I can impress myself with what I grew and also make a good impression on the company. So again, I'm not big on balance. Like I did also take a five week sabbatical in 2021 where I went to the Maldives by myself and literally did not turn on my phone for 10 days. Like there's my idea of balance, but I'm kind of like a zero or a hundred person. And I think we just have to find out what works instead of always being like, oh, I need work-life balance. Maybe you don't. You have to find like the balance or lack of balance that works for you. But you also said, Caroline, and I think it's really important for everybody on the panel as well as everybody that's listening is don't compare yourself to other people. Yeah. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different path. You, you, Nobody should be sitting in judgment about any choices that people make. That's for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the most toxic. Like You should have role models, definitely, and learn from them, ask them questions. But the second you start comparing yourself to someone else, male or female, you've just taken yourself out of the game because- you have no idea what's happening on in someone else's life or what their ambitions are. So just like stick to what you know. It sounds, it is very hard to do, but just stick to what you know, be confident in that. And whatever choice you made, you can always make another one the next day if you weren't happy with it. How about our two youngsters, Danae and, and Sonia? Yeah, I would say <laughs> I'm the exact opposite of Caroline. Um, I am not a workhorse. If I had to work 5 a.m. to midnight, I would have an attitude the entire time. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to say that, like, I'm not someone who works every single game. Um, I work a few games, but I don't have to be at every one. Um, I kind of, like, resent the term work-life balance because I'm like, work is a part of my life. Like, if I were to lose my job today, my life would continue, you know? So... 
that's kind of the, the perspective I take. I create very harsh boundaries at work. Like I had a professor in comm, Professor Quigley. I don't know if he is still there, but he had this saying that kind of like changed my life. He was like, it's PR, not ER. Like we're not saving lives here, people. And like, that is something that I have like, that's stayed with me because I'm like, as much as, you know, at, at least in, at my level, that nothing's going to be an emergency. Like this is sports, you know, like we're not working at the hospital. So that is how I create these harsh boundaries for myself, where it's like, if you email me at 9 PM and it's about a press release about, you know, us selling tickets, like I'm not going to respond because I can get to you in the morning. So, I mean, you have to be like dedicated to creating these boundaries and keeping in mind that you can still do a good job at work and excel without work being your life and it just being a, a part of your life. Yeah, I would I would put myself, I think, somewhere in between um Danae and Caroline, where um, you know, I I I definitely do some things outside of my hours. I try to set some pretty good boundaries for myself. Um, but it I mean, working in sports definitely can be a, a grind. There's always things happening. You know, the news cycle doesn't really end. Um, but I always try to make sure that just for my own sanity, I think that I, I take some time for myself every day. I have a moment where I just like sit and feel at peace and do something I enjoy. Um, not think about baseball, um, you know, <laughs> Because the the seasons, you know, they can be so long. And for again, for baseball, 162 games plus spring training plus the postseason, that's a lot of time to be on your game, you know? So even if I don't get, you know, even if I'm working outside of my, you know, eight hours or whatever it ends up being, you know, just make sure that I, you know, reflect and take some me time. And I think that helps me, you know get going through all of it yeah I love that everybody's got different perspectives on it and and again nobody nobody should sit in judgment and nobody should have any kind of standards other than what's good for their life and I always I, it's like what I always say about athletes uh, but it goes for anybody at all people show you what they want you to see you don't know and and you don't know what goes on in people's lives and it's really nobody's business. So as long as you're happy, whatever, however you define happiness, I think that's what's really important. So I appreciate you all sharing those, those varied perspectives on, the, on, this, uh, on this issue. I have a couple questions here, some of which I must admit I'm not fully understanding. Uh, okay. How would you coach women to break through the crowds of candidates, mostly men, who are trying to get into the sports industry. How can they set themselves apart and stand above the competition to get the interviews and win the quote entry level opportunities that so many new college grads are competing for? Anybody have a thought on that? I'll, I'll give a thought on this because I'm hiring right now. And it's fascinating, Andrea, how many people are applying for jobs by just submitting a resume that doesn't talk anything about why they want the position or sports. Like, I hope everyone on this call knows when you're applying for a job, your resume should be tweaked every single time. You should always submit a cover letter, always give them something thoughtful, try to connect with them on LinkedIn, because re like when you're going through 300 resumes, you get a little overloaded. And so the people that pay the most attention, which is such a basic one-on-one -on -one -on -one communication skill, show why you want the job, make sure there are no typos on anything, but really tailor it. Talk about like tweak something in a way that says that you like sports or why you're a great communicator, how you're a great support system, because I don't think it's necessarily about breaking into sports, especially at the entry level. It's just getting that job and showing why you're going to be a team player. You're a great communicator. You're incredibly flexible and you hold accountability for yourself because those are the things, if you can do that for a manager, like hallelujah. One thing that I try to say to people that I talk to is like, the good thing about PR is that you can do it in any industry. So when I applied for my job at the Bulls, literally didn't know a single person there, submitted my resume, thought I was sending it into a black hole. And I was like, I'm never going to hear from these people again. And here I am a year and a half later. You know, um, I think making sure that like, the core of your skills, regardless of if it's in sports, if it's in healthcare, if it's in 
entertainment or whatever else, making sure that you can show how your core PR skills are transferable regardless of the industry. And um, something that's kind of funny is that when I interviewed, they wanted to make sure that I wasn't a huge Bulls fan because they were like, that might get in the way of you doing your job well. And we don't really want that. We don't have time for you to be fangirling. So that worked out in my favor because I was like, great. All I can tell you about the Bulls is Michael Jordan. Um, but, but even if you're trying to get into an industry and you don't have that previous experience, as long as you have the skills and have the skills to communicate why that'll help you in a new industry, I think, I mean, maybe you won't get the, the job of your dreams, but I think that you'll get somewhere. Let me throw this out because we're, 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 counting down on time here and obviously this is this is a big thing that i hope each of you can weigh in on it's it's two separate questions but it's basically the same thing what advice do you have for soon to be graduates for soon to be graduate applying for her first full time job in sports how do i know if a roller company will be a good fit and basically how you go about finding jobs what what how you reach out to get jobs i would say you know, just to start off, use any connections you have. If anyone's ever told you, you know, reach out if you need anything, you know, take them up on it. I think that can be hard to do sometimes, but, um, you know, that will get you probably at least get your foot in the door somewhere, you know, even if it doesn't end up being a job. And then um, I guess along with that, if knowing if something's a good fit, you know, try to if you happen to have any connections from that company, you know, maybe you can use that. But if not, people in the industry, they do talk amongst each other. So any just general connections you have, like they might know something about the cultures of other companies. Also, it might take you a minute to figure out what in a job would be a good fit. I would say, I mean, it took me like four and a half years to figure out that being in-house was a better fit for me than being at an agency. And the only way that I learned that was being at an agency and seeing that it didn't fit. And so it might take some time to, to figure that out, but I think that kind of like going through it is how you determine what is a good fit for you. I also wanna say BU has an enormous alumni network. Every single job that I've looked at on LinkedIn, it's like, two people from BU were hired here, you know, like, I mean, I'm like, there are a ton of BU people and I've reached out with the same first line. Looks like we're, you know, we're both BU Terriers. And it's like, it sounds cheesy, you know, but it, but it gets your foot in the door. So, so using that alumni network, I mean, like we were in college for four years, you know, we paid a lot of money. We might as well leverage that outside of it and, and try to use that co to connect with people. And I think that it's a really good point because Danae made it clear, like you don't always know until you try it. And so my thing is it might not be the perfect job, but you're going to learn one, you're going to learn what you do and don't want to do. And you're going to get the experience you need. I mean, I, my first on-air job was motorcycle racing, like truly reporting on motorcycle racing. And it ended up being the best five years of my life because it actually proved to my other bosses at Fox that if she can cover motorcycle racing and make it look good and tell stories, she's probably going to be a good reporter at football. And that's really the reason I got hired for other jobs at Fox. So I actually took a job in celebrity PR. I'm looking at both of you guys thinking you guys wouldn't want to work with me. I was so bad at PR. Like it was, what was I doing? I wanted to be on TV. So I had to try it. I did it for eight months and it was not a good fit. So you might have to try something um, and then go from there. But the experience, nothing's ever going to be a bad fit to try something for a year and then decide you have to move on. But, you know, I wish you all the best of luck and use those connections as well. Yeah, I'll just wrap this up by saying one thing is, is what Jenny and Danae were saying is very few people marry the first person they date. Um, <laughs> and so date your job, date your career, just as like as if you were looking to get married or, or whatever that might be. Because when you're applying for a job, don't feel like you need to overly impress them. They need to impress you too. So just remember that you might really want that position, but if it's not the right one, don't 
force it. And as Jenny said too, like every job is going to help you learn something. So even if you're in it and you're like, oh, this isn't the right fit, look for the bright side, look for someone there who you admire, who does a great job that you can learn something from. Because if you ever do make a quick career switch and someone said, well, tell me why you're only at that last job for six months, at least you have something to say in a positive way of what you learned versus, oh, it wasn't the right fit for me. Uh, we're gonna, as we're getting ready to wrap up, um, I'm being asked if, if, if the panel panelists feel comfortable, if you would put your LinkedIn in the chat, that would be great. Of course, I would hope that people could find it even if you don't put it in the chat, but like, I think it's just my name. Is it anything? I, different? I, I, I agree. I, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I think it's maybe, just my name. <laughs> if you Same. can't find somebody's LinkedIn, maybe you're probably not going to be looking for that kind of job. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, I, I want to, um, I want to just add one quick thing. Um, I'm always running over, right, Jenny? We're always talking longer than 25 seconds, right? Okay. Um, Self-advocate, folks. You know your strengths better than anybody. You know what you want, what you're passionate about more than anything. Passion is, to me, that's that is that is that amorphous concept out there that has defined many a career. Uh, ask. The worst someone can say is no and be pleasantly persistent. If you're not, if you're not getting it, uh, if you're not getting any headway, ask why, what can I do better? What, where might a hole be in my resume? Mm -hmm. Ask questions, stay in touch with people. Don't assume people know you exist. People have busy lives. Caroline, Danae, they're all busy. There's 300 resumes that Caroline has. Distinguish yourself, self-advocate, and above all, and I know it sounds like maybe a bunch of BS, if you have a dream, do not let anyone derail it. Do not, do not let anybody tell you no. So Jenny, Caroline, Sonia, Danae, the Dean, Allison, Jen, Bert, thank you so much for, for having us on. I'm sorry that I went two minutes over, three minutes over, there you go. Uh, hope to talk with all of you again soon. Sorry if we didn't get to all your questions. and. Uh, Best of luck, stay healthy, and Jenny, call me anytime. <laughs> nice to chat with all of you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.